I saw Cal sent me a text earlier. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hi, Karen, Stacy, Alexa, Greta, Michelle. Nice to see everybody. <laughs> Hope you guys are staying cool today. Uh, I don't know what the weather's like where Tracy is at. She's in Pennsylvania, but it's pretty hot and dry. It's like um, kind of like when we get the winds in the fall. What's that? What's that weather? Santa Ana. Santa, it feels like the Santa Ana's today. It's hot and dry. <laughs> Hi, John Hickey. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started so we can stay on time. And we're really, really excited to hear what Tracy's going to share with us today. We'll have more people joining us as we start. Um, just a couple of um, housekeeping rules. If you don't know by now, um, please mute yourself when you're not speaking. We recommend speaker view for presentation. Sharing your videos optional, though we do love to see your beautiful faces. And um, please type all your questions and comments into the chat bar. We will have time at the end for Q&A for Tracy, for Dr. Scheffler. Okay, a little quick update on what Autism Tree has been up to over the past 91 days, I think, since shelter in place went into effect. Um, since then, we've now reached over 254,000 people through our social media. Thank you to all of you who helped make that happen. Every one of you who shared a video or posted something fun for our families, thank you. Our posts have been shared over 450 times, which is pretty incredible. We never really focused on shares until COVID. Um, our impact videos on YouTube, we now have over 140. So if you're not a subscriber to our YouTube channel, please become a subscriber. It's free and easy. You can get updates on when we have new videos posted. Um, we also have posted 103 of those videos since March 10th. So we've done crazy video content since March, since everything happened um, with Shelter in Place. We've done our Reading with Autism Tree series. If you haven't yet participated and would like to video, um, a video of you reading a book, Tracy, your kids would love this too, reading a children's book for our kids to watch at home. And we'd love to see your video if you want to send one to me and Rebecca. We have provided 51 virtual events since the end of March, and we have 16 coming up just between now and the end of June. So if you haven't yet plugged your kids into um, one of our virtual events, look at our calendar. We have a lot happening. I'll post the link in the chat bar. And we now offer 17 of our 20 events virtually. And um, we do believe that moving forward, even once we're hopefully past COVID and we're doing more things in person, that we will be able to continue to provide um, virtual versions of many of our programs for our kids and families um, where it's been a real success for them as well as in-person options as well. So that being said, I'm going to pass it over to our founder and volunteer executive director, Dana Hoff. Her, it was actually her husband, um, Todd Hoff, our board chairman, who created the idea of doing these weekly lunch and learns. Um, we do the shelter in place and we're very thankful. They've been a great way for us to stay connected and hear from experts in their field. Dana's going to introduce you to Dr. Tracy Shepler. Hi, ATPF family. So happy to see you all and just tell you um, what it's meant to me to all of us together getting through um, shelter in place is incredible. Um, Let's see, we've got through March, April, May, now we're in June. And um, it really touched me. Every single Lunch and Learn has been, um, it's, it's really not quantifiable to me personally. And I know I've, I've talked before and kind of everything builds on each other. Um, so if you're new, I've always been talking lately about how all of us are so unique and we all have 724 trillion cells, not billion, but trillion. And that makes us incredible. We, we're limitless um, in our possibilities. And when we reflect and just take in um, what we've been able to accomplish together, I'm unbelievably grateful um, to our Autism Tree team for working tirelessly, providing um, for the community, all the programs that we normally do. Some of our programs are even more impactful. This Lunch and Learn um, is not something I could really put into words. My, my thing that I want you to know is 
um, it meant a lot last time when everyone typed in something, when I, I forgot what I asked right now, but then we followed up with it and shared it. Right now, what I wanna share with you is the biggest blessing I'm counting right this second is you. I just want to sincerely thank each of you for making time to be together, look at each other, connect, learn, and grow. And um, I, you know, I have personally valued each one of these lunch and learns so much. They've been each very, very unique. And um, I have shared a lot of personal stuff lately with the hope that um, it, it's meaningful because I value everybody's time. I know everyone is stretched past capacity. So I want to thank you deeply for that. So if you want to type in what you count right now as a blessing, I would love to see it. I love that connection and letting you have a voice, hearing your voice. Um, one thing I've been working on um, at my house with Todd and Garrett is the emotions are so high. We have such strong feelings about so many things. It's hard to filter um, them all. And I'm really wanting to not have my heart edited, like to edit how, someone to edit how I feel and say like, you shouldn't feel like that or get over it or any of that. Um, I'm really conscious of saying, I want to hear your heart and I don't want to edit it. I don't think we should edit each other's hearts. So I'm working on that um, daily right now um, with, with each other in my own conversations with my husband, Todd, if you haven't met him, my son, Garrett, just to say, let's not edit each other's hearts. Let's listen and learn and, and not judge, you know, and that's part of a bigger picture in our country and our world right now. And I think anybody that really knows the foundation knows how is it, how do we do it? We do it from our hearts, our heart connection. And on that point, I think it's a really um, perfect entry to introducing Tracy. And how I've been introducing each speaker is more from a personal standpoint of how, how I know them to Autism Tree and introducing to you almost like a family member. So Tracy is Dr. Shepler. And of course, she has earned that um, big time. And what touches me as her friend is I met her when she called, um, letting me know she was in Camp, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Her husband um, was a Marine and they were moving to California. I remember everything about the phone call. I happened to have been in San Jose at my mom's house. So that was 2008. I had to ask Tracy on our pre-call to this. Um, the amount of challenge um, that Tracy has gone through as a mother, as a wife, as a leader, um, it is, is it would I can't even go, I can't even try to, to, to cap capture it. But what I can say is that Tracy and I have been together the whole time, and what she's done is fully remarkable. And I don't really know another mother who's done it. And it's that she took these incredible challenges and she became a doctor, literally. She did her thesis on bullying. And we all know most of our kids, all of our, I mean, we, we, I was at a kindergarten um, classrooms, four different ones um, in um, Media, Pennsylvania. Uh, the teachers were reading uh, Joel's book on bullying and how to have courage to stand up to someone in need. And it really blew my mind. Every little kindergartner raised their hand when the teacher said, has any of you ever been bullied? Every single kindergartner in all four kindergarten rooms raised their hand. It was a lot of kindergartners. I can't remember the total, but Tracy did her thesis on bullying. Tracy has taken every challenge she's had and you are meeting her today and she is a doctor. She is a, part, a family member of Autism Tree and the slides that you saw Tracy has led the parent mentor program for years. Tracy's son, Derek, co-founded the teen program. And then um, our teens wanting to go to college. Tracy co-founded the college readiness program. You see in this picture with um, Victoria Eichhardt. 
and Victoria's daughter, Sabine, co-founded the teen program. And it's a launching point. Today in our you know, neuroscience conferences, you see Tracy and her son, Derek, there with the background at a neuroscience conference. Um, we love having Derek has been on the neuroscience conference committees. Derek is an incredible asset, as Tracy is, to our ATPF family and team. It's um, pretty extraordinary, Tracy, I, when I reflected on just how much that we've been through, um, starting as the foundation mentoring you and your family, going through so many things. And one thing that um, touched me deeply, and I know will touch Karen Wright on this call, is that we, at our um, annual meeting that we had to thank everybody, I'm like blanking what month that was now, but the recent one, Derek was there and um, he let me know he still has his prayer quilt that Karen Wright got for him when he went through some big challenges and I believe he was 12 then. And Tracy, you'll have to say how old Derek is now, but um, the amount of teamwork and family that came together with the Scheffler family upon, literally upon their arrival to California in, since 2008, has been this like incredible metamorphosis of Tracy and her family becoming leaders and running many programs and now moving to Pennsylvania. Tracy's coming to us from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And I'm gonna be going back in July and we ha it's so interesting what we have going on on the East Coast. And now that's where Tracy's headquartered out of. And I think there's just no accidents. And it's with great honor that if you haven't met Tracy, you're gonna love meeting her. And um, I probably haven't told you enough, Tracy, how proud I am of you for being a doctor and all the work that you're doing at the VA hospital in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, and um, everything you've ever done for Autism Tree of just extraordinarily I'm grateful and um, love you so much. Thanks for being here today. Well, I am so happy to be here. Thank, thank you so much, Dana, for all of the very sweet and heartfelt thoughts. Definitely feeling some emotion here as I'm uh, surrounded by the AETF crew. I definitely miss all of you. And uh, I guess maybe this is kind of a silver lining with the idea of this virtual connection that I can be in Pennsylvania and just finish my work day and then it's still af afternoon time there, right? Um, it's, uh, so let me first an answer your question, Dana. Derek is now 22, which is incredible. Um, okay. and autism tree has been such a blessing though and it's I feel like we as a family have kind of grown up with that support and it it's it's interesting to look back on some of the old photos and to just see the growth of Derek the growth of our family the growth of the autism tree like I think just even the fact that you guys have this virtual platform is fantastic you know this has really made people have, have to stretch in ways that they really didn't know they could or maybe didn't plan on doing in order to try to meet people. Um, I'm sitting here, this is actually my home office. I've been teleworking for the last couple of months. Um, we've actually had a lot of COVID cases here. And so I actually, last week was week 10 teleworking. And so um, I know a lot of you are parents, so if you can imagine, <laughs> you have kids, and I do have four dogs, so my disclaimer at the beginning of every video session I do is you may hear dogs in the background, so hope, hopefully they'll, they'll be good for us. Um, and so I, I hope this talk today can feel meaningful for, for everyone, and I think if I would just ask one thing, um, what I was hoping for us to cover was just to really kind of have a discussion of strategies and ways to preserve mental health um, just during really just kind of wild and chaotic times. And you would think um, within the autism community, it's like, well, most, most of us are pretty familiar with the concept of chaotic times or uncharted territory. 
And I think that this can tax even the most seasoned parents. Like, I don't know anyone who hasn't been impacted by the things going on, um, maybe directly with, with your family, where you live, with work. Um, kids' schedules have been totally disrupted. You know, parents' schedules completely changed. And some of this may feel, um, it seems like in some ways we might be coming out of the whole COVID pandemic in some areas, but yet may, maybe not. And so I would just say that I think a lot of these strategies could also just be utilized this summer and can be help, helpful for nourishing yourself as parents. So then you're able to also be there to, to support our kids. Um, as someone who has take, taken on a lot of, uh, we'll say uh, stressors by choice over the years, whether that was graduate school or work or just like any of those kinds, kinds of things. We, ha we have to fill our gas tank and we have to nurture ourselves and take care of ourselves. And so um, it would be wonderful if, um, so within the vein of that topic, if you guys had anything specific that you wanted to send in the chat that you would hope would be covered or addressed that I can try to scroll through those and then maybe we we could try to talk about some of those things along the way too and, and just incorporate that into the talk. And I did see it, I did see a couple highs in in the chat. Um, I am super excited to see all of you guys. I'm just kind of scrolling through through here real quick. So thank you for saying hi. Um, so on that note, I'll just kind of go ahead and we can get started here. And then I'll just kind of keep an eye on the chat box. And uh, Lisa, if you see something and you want to jump jump in and ask a question, um, I am I am totally fine with that. So. Yeah, and we'll have time at the end for Q&A also for, for Dr. Shepler. Yeah. And uh, I would really like for this to kind of be more in formal and, um, and yet there's some things that I would like to cover that I think are important too. So I think one of the, one of the things that we've, we've learned along the way is um, maintaining a regular schedule. I'm like, okay, what does that look like in, in the world of no school or virtual school? summertime. I can tell you what that can look like. That can look like kids wearing the same clothes for a couple days and not waking up until two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and that can have some problems too. Um, you, you know, sleep is such an important function. And I think about how a lot of our kids on the spectrum plus children in general, you know, really thrive when they have a consistent schedule. And so we're really trying to encourage a, a relatively consistent wake up time can be very helpful. Um, and yet, as I say that, I also want to caveat that with, this is a hard time. It's a hard time for parent. It's a hard time for kids. And so, you know, can we have a schedule and still be flexible and still, you know, know when it's time to maybe make little allowances. Like me personally, I thought, yeah, nine, nine sounds like a good wake up time. And after a joint discussion, I was overruled and we agreed in the summertime, 12 was okay. <laughs> so we're, so we're personally going with noon, but that's, I have tween and teen girls. So, so that's fine for that age group. Um, Another big one is just really trying to plan consistent meals and snacks, you know, between the constant grazing and in my 10th week of uh, telework, I can attest to how it can be really easy just to grab, you know, the wrong kinds of foods and, um, and then the kids aren't eating healthy and then they aren't feeling well and they've got like stomach aches and you know, so that's just kind of another thing to keep in mind that, again, 
do we want to be flexible? Of course. So, you know, I buy the fun snacks and sometimes it helps to maybe portion out some snacks and to put them in a basket and leave them out and say, okay, here's like the junk snacks, but then you also, here's, here's the healthy food to try to get in today too. Um, and I think just having some kind of structure. So <laughs> I see John Hickey. <laughs> yes, there is a time difference. Yes. Um, so, so having some structure, I don't know, for those of you who have kids with electronics, um, you know, if there's free and open access all the time, let's say to whether it's the Xbox, the PlayStation, the iPhone, the tablet, the computers, it could really just kind of um, become all encompassing and then nothing else is done. Like they don't really engage in any other activities, you know, and at the same time, you know, do we want to give them time to enjoy those kinds of things? I mean, I, I'm a supporter of moderation. Like, I think that that's kind of a good approach in life in general. And I like to, my hope is, is that my kids will be able to kind of balance and say, all right, this is my fun time. I can play my Minecraft and I can do this for a little while, but then I also need to do these other things. And so um, that kind of moves into the next part of this, of uh, being outside. You, you know, I think this idea of this shelter in place, as long as this has happened, outside movement, whether that's walking around the yard, going for a walk, um, we have four dogs, so we have lots of dogs that can be walked, so whatever that looks like for your family. Um, making sure that you're um, moving and and that they aren't sedentary for too long. I think, um, so I am a clinical psychologist. I'm also a BCBA, and um, in my earlier uh, part of my career, and I, and I could say that there is something to be said for tiring kids out and tiring adults out too. You know, that if you aren't doing a lot and if there's a lot of sedentary, um, just kind of sitting around, you know, that also has a tendency to be correlated with some depression symptoms over time. So just something to kind of keep in mind is that not only is it good for the kids' health, it's good for your health as well to try to keep moving in some shape or form. And I would also say, especially for parents and kids, and figuring out what does that self-care look like for kids and what does that self-care look like for you? And as an autism parent, family member, caregiver, self-care a lot of times has a tendency to fall by the wayside. And you know, because there's a ten because there's a tendency to feel like everyone else comes first. And, you know, well, that would be selfish if I was doing that, but not at all. And so I would just encourage ev everyone to really ask yourself, what does self-care look like for you? Is is that um, is that taking a bubble bath at the end of the day? Like, are you able to get that 30 minutes in? Is is it maybe taking a little bit of time to read. A uh, practice that I've developed over, over the last five years or so is meditation. That's something that I'm a really big believer in and it helps for me to maintain focus, especially in stressful and chaotic circumstances. Um, yep, and I just saw Karen wrote, praying with your family on a daily basis keeps hope hope alive. Ab absolutely. I would say, you know, incorporating, making sure that those things make the schedule of priorities. I would rank doing some aspect of self-care just as important as physical activity, food. Um, I would say any of those things. And even trying to find a way to interact with loved ones. Um, unfortunately, that, that may mean vir virtually for some people. And uh, Dana can attest to, we've had vir virtual 
groups and chats and stuff like that. And it's just been so nourishing and uplifting and, and it feels like it feeds your soul and it helps you to, um, just feel kind of invigorated, you know, and ready to take on the challenges of life. Another thing I, uh, <laughs> so I guess this is somewhat personal. Our kids are really struggling at first with the virtual platform, the school, like half, half the time it didn't work um, or it was really repetitive. Yeah, um, I, I think we, I think we could definitely come back to that, Alex. Um, I think that's an important thing to hit on. So um, one of the things that I did, I'm not necessarily advocating that every parent do this. In our situation, this felt appropriate, but my kids were getting so frustrated right at the onset of COVID where they couldn't access their classes and so I'm like, okay, well, let's come up with some things to, to do today that are educational. So one of them was, okay, let's learn how to sew. And so at some point I had to figure out how to use a sewing machine that I've had for 14 years. I'm not sewing inclined, but one of my daughters and I, we, we did a sewing project and we actually started making some masks. Um, the first ones came out like this big, so that didn't work, but with time we started to get a little better. Um, painting cooking, gardening, you know, it can be a really good opportunity to develop hobbies. You know, leisure time is something that I don't think that we've thought about as a society very often. And yet that's also one of the things that um, our kids on the spectrum can struggle with, you know, like for people who have done ABA in the past, you know, we actually program for leisure skills, you know, and when was the last time as an adult where you said, well, what's my hobby? What do I like to do? You know, and, and so I do think that in this time where people aren't going out as much, this could be a good opportunity to do your own self-exploration as well as maybe something that you can do as a family. Um, and so uh, the next point here is on mindfulness. And I would say that, you know, this, this could include prayer. This, this could look like a lot of different things. I feel like when I use the term mindfulness, people are like, well, what exactly is, is that? And so I will give you the definition that I used and that I learned, you know, in school and, you know, like clinical training and stuff. That's, it's, it's essentially paying attention to something on purpose non-judgmentally in the present moment. And so one of the things that can happen in like a really chaotic time is that we can find ourselves distracted and we can find ourselves on autopilot to the point where we're just going through the motions and then we stopped connecting in meaningful ways in our environment. And maybe that's with each other. Maybe that's just in our work. You, you know, whatever it is that that day-to-day -day look looks like. I remember um, when I was first exposed to mindfulness, one of the funniest moments that hit me as a mom, I, I was like so busy in graduate school. And then one day I looked at my middle child at my older daughter. And I thought, I just want to count the freckles on your face. <laughs> and so we stood there in the kitchen and I like counted. I believe it was somewhere around like 41 freckles on her face. Um, you know, that can be like an application of mindfulness. And then, um, you know, one of the areas, that, well, the area that I actually work in right now is helping people to manage chronic pain. And, um, and so the VA came out with this app and I'm just sharing it just because it's free. A lot of the things that the VA puts out are for public consumption. So this is a free app. It's available on iPhones. It's also available on Android devices. It's called COVID Coach. And it is actually excellent. Um, I'm not always a huge app fan. I would say that a lot of these apps could actually 
be used by kids who might be a little bit more tech savvy. It, it's very easy to use. It's just like a couple clicks and then you get right to where you want to go. There's some um, really brief meditation exercises that are wonderful for stress management. So this can include guided imagery where you know, you're being walked through this meditation exercise by the beach. Um, I personally like that one. I'm kind of missing the beach right now in PA. Uh, there's um, a forest one. There's a leaves on a stream exercise that I also really like. So there's just some great ones on, on there and they can absolutely be kid and teen appropriate too. Um, and then so that kind of, I think, brings me into the next section here about, I think it's really important to, and I think you may have started to touch on this, Dana, like, I think we want to, I think we want to guard our hearts and, and guard what we are exposed to in the sense that um, I think it's very important to be aware. I think we need to be aware about dangers. I think we need to be aware about things that are going on in the world. I think that only helps us as a society. And yet at the same time, I also believe that we can over consume. And um, to the point that you know, the question that I always ask at the end of the day, is this help? Is this helpful for my overall goals or is it, or is it harmful? Like, is this actually helping me to get closer to things that are important and valuable to me or is it harmful? And that's kind of how I try to set my limit in terms of social media, in terms of the news that it's, like, you know, you feel like you're, you know, there are all, all those memes going on about 2020. It's like, okay, well, what's, what's next was like murder hornets or something like that, that, that it's like at some point, um, I would just say guard your, a guard your level of stress and just be aware of, um, how you're feeling in the moment and what, and what your limits are. Um, another component I would say is, you know, just trying to spend spend some time outside each day. And vitamin D is good for mood. Vitamin D is is good for. Um, I think they're even showing now it's good for balance. Like it, um, I think that's even come up with uh, some of the co COVID liter literature as well. Um, spending out time side up spending side outside time is healthy. Um, and so yes, we talked a little bit about the food earlier. And I would say a big one that I want to hit on is to be compassionate with yourself. You know, if you're struggling, that is okay. And so are most people, <laughs> you know, if your child is struggling, so are a lot of other kids. And I think it's a really good time to be compassionate. And the more compassionate we are, as a society, that's only going to help us move through the challenges that we're experiencing right now. I don't know if anyone has ever heard of Kristen Neff's TED Talk. Um, this, so it's Kristen Neff. I don't know if you can see it on the screen. Um, the name of the talk is uh, The Space Between Self-Compassion and Self-Esteem. And if you don't know her story, she would be an excellent video to watch and that could maybe even be its own lunch and learn is actually to watch it and then maybe have a discussion about you know what the impression is and how people um, experience that but essentially she was she's a clinical psychologist and a mom to a son with autism and talked about a lot of her own struggles with um kind of beating herself up along the way sometimes and feeling like she wasn't doing enough or feeling like she wasn't doing a good enough job. And I don't know anyone who is not um, feeling that way in some shape or form. So again, I would really encourage you to watch that. And I think one of the nice things that she does is she actually does a demonstration of 
how do you apply self-compassion to yourself? What does that look like? So big takeaways would be, I would really encourage the self-care part and really encourage self-compassion because when those are there, you're going to find that you're more patient and you're going to find that you're more able to manage a lot of the stressors that come up and you're not going to feel as overwhelmed and you're going to feel like you have the space to hold these other things going on. And so I think some of you guys may have seen this kind of flo floating around. I had sent this to Lisa and Dana. This was kind of early in the whole COVID process. And I think what really spoke to me is, I think when all of the COVID stuff kicked off, this could even apply to more recent events as well, um, with protests and, you know, some of the rioting that's happened, um, you know, about what it can look like when we're in the fear zone, you know, that when people are responding in a place of fear, that the that can lead to problems, right? Like one is preserving oneself in the moment. However, it can certainly lead to problems in the sense of, you know, not being able to find toilet paper anywhere, right? Because people were like responding in this fear, fear space. Um, I'm trying to think, three weeks ago, I finally found SpaghettiOs, which was on the food, shopping request list. I'm like, where did all those SpaghettiOs go? I don't understand. <laughs> um, but that's coming from the fear zone though. You know, when, when people are scared, they can act sometimes in irrational ways. Well, we see that with our kids too, right? And, and so I think a lot of the goal here is to say, okay, well, how do I how do I try to transition out of this fear mode? And then that's when we got into consumption mode and learning mode. Um, that, that's also where we can do some teaching about teaching our kids, okay, how do we recognize when we're responding in a place of fear that's reactive and, and maybe versus something that's a little bit more proactive. Um, and, and then ultimately when we're in the growth zone, Hence, we're doing a lunch and learn in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> that might be a good application of the growth zone. Um, we should also keep in mind though, this is very fluid. One can be in the growth zone and then bam, right back in the fear zone. And so it's important to realize that it's not like we just move from one stage neatly to, to the other, um, add other stressors and whoop, we might be back there again. There's talk about, well, what is school going to look like in the fall, right? Um, whoop, right back to the fear zone. Well, I don't know if my kid can wear a mask. Like, I don't know if they can, if they can do all these things. And that's also where the mindfulness part comes back into play, right? When, when you find yourself really starting to kind of jump ahead and worry about some of these things, how do you um, bring yourself back to the present moment and say, okay, these are the things that are within my control now. These are the things that I can focus on and still finding ways to have meaningful engagement. You know, like it would be sad to look back and say, you know what, I can't really think of, of anything meaningful that I did during this time. So every day is still a new opportunity to still try to have some kind of meaningful engagement in something, even with all these things going on. And the more we can be in the moment, the more that just helps to ground us. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go to the uh, chat here just so I can read some of this. Okay. Sorry. Um, I, know, I know that Alex wanted to talk about yeah. video games, right. social media. Tracy, yeah. if you could address that. I know a lot of us are dealing with that with our kids and ourselves during this time as well. So specifically within the realm of how do you, how do you budget their time if they are getting sucked in and they're having a hard time limiting themselves or Hi, yes, sorry, I'm driving. Um, yeah. 
Yes, you know, they're, you know, it's really hard for them sometimes to regulate their social media, video gaming, da da da. And if we're not mindful of reminding them that, hey, you just spent two hours YouTube in, or and with also learning through email, they can, they're spending hours and hours at in in front of screens, yeah. and that just is not good for their mental, you know, well-being. So I just thought it was really important then to like bring that up that yeah have them take breaks you know remind them to maybe set their timer and I don't know what do you what do you think well I think that right there is good reminding them to take breaks setting timers is a great strategy because if one advantage to teaching them to set a timer versus you setting a timer for them is that ultimately we want them to learn self-management skills, right? Where they don't need somebody like managing their behavior. The goal is to transfer this where they can learn to manage this on their own. And sometimes it comes down to a, um, where as a parent, it's like, okay, well, we're not going to do this anymore right now. So now we need to shift gears. But ultimately though, I think the first approach is of trying to get them to set a timer and manage it themselves is ideal. Another thing though is that I've I've noticed is sometimes they don't know what to do. You know, we are kind of cre creatures of habit and that maybe um like I found myself kind of buying um art art supplies and keep in mind this is through trial and error too where it's like whoa okay everyone's on their phones way too much. We need to get some other activities going on. And so it would be getting some stuff to paint with. It would be getting, you know, I had talked about the sewing thing earlier. So they actually have some options and even asking them, like, don't you have something, some hobby that you want to work on? Maybe it's Legos, maybe it's building. So sometimes too, it's just a matter of they don't really know what to do. It's, it's easy. They start doing it. Um, they get sucked into it. Same way we could get sucked into like binge watching some new series on Netflix. <laughs> and so I think helping them to come up with new ideas can also be a good strategy. Um, I also think it's a good opportunity of work, of um, balancing work and play, where, you know, there's certain responsibilities that are supposed to be done. And, you know, whether that's helping with a certain amount of chores and stuff like that, that, that um, when those things are done, then it's okay to do, um, phone and iPads and that and that kind of thing. But I think each family is different. The culture within each family is different. So it also means exploring what works for your family. Yeah, is absolutely. Um, we have two about two minutes left. So I just wanted to make sure if anybody else has a question for Dr. Shepler, you can um, raise your hand or unmute or if you had a comment or if you want to put it in the chat. I just want to make sure we address any other topics that you guys would like to share today. I, I love what you shared, Tracy, about how mindfulness combats fear. I guess I had never really thought of it that way. I guess I, I guess I hadn't really put mindfulness and fear together in mm -hmm. that way. But really, you're saying, you know, in those cycles, from the fear zone to the learning zone to the growth zone, you can fluctuate between all three of them at any given time, but how do you get the fear out? You come back to that mindfulness practice. Yeah. I think it's a challenge, you know, but really good for all of us to be very aware of at this time when we have so much noise in the world coming at us yeah. all the time. And, and most of it is fear, you know, not, I would say not the minority is positive. The majority yeah. is fear and you know, that's, that's a good takeaway from today. You have so many good points, but I love that mindfulness combats fear. Um, that really stuck with me. Thank you for sharing that. Lisa, um, and, Tracy, I want to tell you, um, I had a quote that we didn't, I didn't cover when I introduced you. I don't know if we can bring that up because we'll send it out and follow up, but um, can you bring that quote yeah, up? I'll work um, right now, hold on. Okay. It's because I, I thought um, it was relevant. <laughs> Sharing it right now. Okay. okay. 
So the truth strength of any relationship is measured in bad times, not good. And I felt like when I thought about you, this was so relevant. I mean, probably one of the biggest challenges we've ever faced as a foundation, as a team was with, with, with you and your family. Yeah. And, um, and it really is a testament to, I think that's more of the norm at Autism Tree. It's certainly not you know, people are get, have children getting diagnosed and that's where we, our entry point usually is. But specifically, Tracy, with you and I, um, I felt like that quote was just dead on, you know, we bonded over, we've, we've had a blast together so many times outside of autism tree stuff, but our bonding came from the challenges and the, and the dark times. <laughs> and um, so I love that quote and I picked it today when I was introducing you and I feel like it's relevant to everybody because Right now, the Zoom is something we're, we're doing together during dark times in our country. But I think we're experiencing something very, very, um, I feel blessed by it. And I hope everyone else does too, in terms of our connection that we're making each time we get together. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I would say too, in terms of fear and I think to what Elise Lisa had commented on. I actually have two two thoughts with that. The first is, you know, there's an expression that we use um, when kind of tapping into mindfulness. It's like it's like dropping anchor, finding a way to connect in the present moment, and, and figuring out what that looks like for you. Sometimes for me, it's walking barefoot in the grass. I don't know why, but I love walking barefoot in the grass. Yeah, Probably because I don't have the beach anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, um, so figuring out how to like drop anchor to get back into the present moment. And then the other thing I think to keep in mind is storms always eventually pass. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just something to uh, stay hopeful about that even the strongest, scariest storms do eventually pass. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shepler. We're just at time. And so I just want to say it's such an honor to have you today all the way thank from the you. East Coast with us. I know everyone enjoyed um, hearing you share. And we're going to be sending a follow-up email with um, resources from Tracy and um, some of the topics that she covered today. If you have a um, question for her that didn't get answered, we'll put her email in the follow-up email. Mm -hmm. And you can email her directly if you had a question. But thank you to everybody. We hope you have a beautiful week. Shout out to everybody that came in from the East Coast or other states. Yeah, and that's Cindy, right. Who, was Jeff on there? Heidi. Heidi, yeah. Thank you guys. Have a beautiful day. And we'll Are see we you all Are we doing a group picture? Oh, Rebecca, can you take one group shot really quick? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we'll do one group photo really quick. Well, John's on the beach for you, Tracy. You didn't <laughs> okay, <everybody laughs> smile. One, two, three. Perfect. All right, awesome. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye, guys.